Greetings, folks, and welcome to the wonderful world of ancient Mesopotamia. For a little talk today, what I'd like to do is give you some background on both Mesopotamia generally and the Epic of Gilgamesh specifically. I'm not quite sure how long this will take, as I tend to record these lectures one slide at a time and then mash them together and edit them when I'm done talking, but I don't think it should take too long, and I do hope you find it interesting. One thing I like to do when I'm teaching Gilgamesh is start with my rather idiosyncratic understanding or approach to time. That is, I like to pose the question, how ancient is ancient? Our species has been on the planet for somewhere between two and three hundred thousand years. And while our antecessor species, Homo heidelbergensis, just in case you're curious, almost certainly had some rudimentary capacity for speech, it appears that we've been speaking in something like what we would consider language in the contemporary sense for somewhere between 150,000 and 50,000 years. These dates being based on archaeological finds whose explanations would be difficult at the far end and virtually impossible at the near end in the absence of language. Specifically, evidence for fairly widespread trade routes by 150,000 years ago, and advances in technology sometimes referred to as the Great Leap Forward about 50,000 years ago. Looked at in that sense, the agricultural revolution, the development of farming, which happened first in the so-called ancient Near East about 10,000 years ago, doesn't seem that distant. And as for the development of cities, and with cities the development of writing only 5,000 years ago, well, that just seems like the blink of an eye, doesn't it? I'm reminded of a professor of medieval literature I had during my master's, Dick Guerin, wonderful man, who used to say that everything written since 1500 is just journalism. And the reason I bring this up is that anything at all that we encounter in writing is going to be less than 5,000 years old. That is, it's only in the last couple of percent of our existence on the planet that we've started writing things down. Well, what this means, because, of course, while we are always changing, we change very slowly over evolutionary time. The people who wrote down, for example, the Epic of Gilgamesh and the various myths related to it were the same kind of people as us. They had the same questions, they had the same concerns, they had the same range of emotions that we have, and they had the same intellectual capacity that we have. In any meaningful way, they were exactly like us. And I think sometimes the brevity of our lives gives us this illusory notion that the past as we encounter it in writing is more distant than it actually is. And the people we encounter in the writing of the past are, are more distant from us than they actually are. But as long as we're on the topic of writing, why don't we talk about the beginnings of that? The first writing systems were developed probably about 5,500 years ago more or less simultaneously in ancient Egypt and in ancient Sumer. These writing systems were both pictographic, that is, they gave stylized representations of the specific things to which they referred, which meant, of course, that they rapidly became very unwieldy. If you need a different character for everything and every idea that you want to convey, well, the number of characters gets to be very large, very fast. So around about 5,000 years ago, or a little before that, the Sumerians developed the first form of phonetic writing. This is called cuneiform because the letters were made by pressing a reed cut so as to make a conical shape into tablets of unbaked clay in the various configurations to stand for the various sounds. As for the Sumerians themselves, they occupied a chunk of land that we refer to now as Mesopotamia, literally meaning the land between the rivers, the rivers in this case being the Tigris and the Euphrates, and extending upriver from the Persian Gulf to roughly the location of contemporary Baghdad. But the Sumerians didn't just give us writing. They actually introduced many of the facets of both technology and thought 
that we rely on today in our own society. For instance, they were the first to develop schools, which sort of makes sense, I suppose. If you've got a writing system, you've got to have some place to teach it. And they were also the first to write down their laws. So in a sense, all written law codes owe their existence to the Sumerians. This, of course, is a big deal because only with writing are human knowledge and human thought able to transcend the limits of the human skull. We're no longer limited in our knowledge and in our thought to what one person can acquire over the course of a lifetime and manage to pass on to the next person, and so on and so forth. With writing, and only with writing, does knowledge become transgenerational. And only with writing can distant generations speak to much, much later generations in their own words, in their own terms, rather than through the imperfect recollections of successions of individual brains. But as long as we're on the topic of things the Sumerians did first and passed on to subsequent civilizations, there's always math. They kind of invented math. They had uh, an, arith an arithmetic based on alternating base 10, then base 6, which is actually quite sensible because 60 is divisible by more whole numbers than 100. So it may sound counterintuitive to us because we do straight base 10, but theirs actually worked pretty well. They also divided the circle into 360 degrees. So they kind of also invented geometry or the beginnings of geometry. Another discipline to which we owe the Sumerians thanks is accounting. They had the first accountants. In fact, their system of writing was invented primarily for accounting purposes. About 95% of the surviving tablets from, uh, from ancient Sumer are of an accounting nature. They're about property, property transactions, property transfers, lists of things that people own, transactions of various kinds. That is, writing was not invented for literature. It wasn't invented for religion. It wasn't invented for philosophy. It wasn't invented for any of the things that, that we're doing in this class and that we consider it to be central to now because it is. It was invented for purely pragmatic purposes, for keeping track of stuff. Other contributions that the Sumerians made to really all subsequent civilizations were astronomy, the systematic observation of the sky, the division of time into hours, minutes, and seconds, bronze smelting, they were the first people to enter the Bronze Age out of the Stone Age. Irrigation canals, that is, they were the first to exert human control over, over the flowing of water on a large scale and in a systematic way. And on the topic of water, while they did not invent boats, they did invent sailing, and they were also the first people to use the wheel. It's difficult to imagine how our world would look without any of these. And the one I want to focus on for this slide is actually the most subtle, time, hours, minutes, and seconds. Because this is how we think about time. This isn't something external to us, but this is part of the fabric of our actual thought. The way we process, the way we experience our movement through time is mediated by categories of thought invented by the Sumerians. This is fundamental and really intimate stuff. But as long as we're on the topic of the arts of civilization, let's talk about civilization itself because they kind of invented that too. And I'm using civilization here in a very specific technical way. The word is based around the Latin civitas, meaning city. And civilization understood that way is a society built around or organized around the structure of the city, the intellectual, social, and, and physical structure of the city. The Sumerians had 12 city-states, Kish, Uruk, which is the biblical Eric, this is where Gilgamesh is from, Or, Sippur, Akshak, Larak, Nippur. Nippur was their spiritual center. It was the home of the temple of Enlil, their chief god. Adab, Uma, Lagash, 
Badtibira, and Larsa. One of the notable functions of the city, or one of the notable traits of the city of civilized life, is the division of labor, the arising of specialization. Prior to this, pretty much everybody had to be a generalist. Everybody had to know how to farm, for example. Nobody, or very few people, had the leisure to actually become craftspeople. By pooling economic resources in the city, what the Sumerians were able to do was to allow specific disciplines to emerge, to allow people to focus on both physical and intellectual skills that take a lifetime to master and that therefore could not arise until a certain critical mass, a certain critical social mass had been reached, or rather we might say a certain critical threshold of complexity. They were also the first to develop the office of sacred or priestly kingship. That is, the union of church and state we can also trace back to, to ancient Sumer. The city-states themselves were first unified around 2800 BC under, under Etana of Kish. Their unity politically lasted for a good few centuries, but ultimately ended up being weakened, of course, by rivalries among the cities. And, uh, and by the fact that they had no standing army. So around 2340 BC, they were conquered by Sargon of Akkad. Now the Akkadians are, or rather were, a Semitic speaking people. That is, their language was one of the Semitic languages related to Babylonian, Phoenician, Hebrew, Arabic. And they adopted the cuneiform alphabet of the Sumerians and also cultivated the Sumerian language as their literary and religious language, very much as Latin was cultivated in the Middle Ages. So that even though the Sumerians who briefly gained independence for about a century under Ur, between 2150 and 2050 BC, were permanently submerged as a political entity by the end of the second millennium BC, their language continued in use as the language of learning of subsequent civilizations, including, as I've said, the Akkadians and also the Babylonians. And it's for this reason, even though their language is very different from the Semitic languages, that it was able to be deciphered over the course of the 20th century. Now, in addition to their writing system, the Sumerians also bequeathed much of their mythological material, much of their religious material, not just their gods, but also a number of other characters and motifs, to subsequent Mesopotamian societies. Theirs, of course, was a polytheistic mythology. And I think this is worth commenting on generally before we go into discussing some of the specific gods that we meet in, in Gilgamesh. Often in modern society, polytheism is portrayed as being primitive, a more primitive version of religion, and monotheism as a more advanced version of religion. This portrayal, of course, is generally done by the monotheist camp, uh, and so can't be taken at face value. What the gods do in polytheistic mythologies, polytheistic religions, is they tend to embody the forces that move the world, both externally and internally. That is, the forces of, of nature and the forces of the human psyche. And they do this very often really well through narrative that is often not meant to be taken literally. That is, the way to read any religious or mythological text is, is not to finish up with a literal reading. That's about the most simplistic reading you can have and about the least useful and the least interesting. So as we're looking at these gods, what I would like you to be thinking about is, what are they? What do they embody? What do they collectively say, not just about Gilgamesh and the narrative that we're going to experience with him, but what do they say about us? What do they say about the world? What do they say about humanity? I find, as I immerse myself in multiple polytheistic mythologies quite regularly, that they still have a lot they can say to us, and a lot of that is very much worth listening to. As I said to another one of my classes earlier this term, while I don't believe in the gods, I do respect them. Of course, the god that's of most interest to us is the goddess Ishtar, whose Sumerian name was Inanna. 
By the time you reach the halfway point of the epic, you will have met Ishtar, and she's a lot of fun. In fact, she's probably my favorite god or goddess ever. She's associated with sex, love, fertility on the one hand, and warfare on the other. Her Phoenician counterpart is Astarte, who makes an appearance in the Hebrew Old Testament under that name, and she is also related to the Egyptian goddess Isis. She's the source as well of the Greek Aphrodite, who is associated with particularly sex and all things erotic. And while in the Homeric tales and in the Hesiodic tales we have, she is not warlike. She was worshipped in Sparta as Aphrodite Araya, warlike Aphrodite. That is, Sparta seems to have held on to uh, a fuller interpretation of what Aphrodite was. She's associated with the planet Venus. In fact, Inanna was the Sumerian name for the planet Venus. So in a sense, when we're looking at Inanna, Ishtar, Astarte, Aphrodite, Isis, and Venus, we're looking at a broad distribution of multiple interpretations of this one particular goddess, along with various tales associated with Gilgamesh. Early narratives of Inanna constitute some of the oldest narratives that have survived in writing. And I think for next week, I am going to give you a couple of the hymns to Inanna because they're very interesting and, and because Gilgamesh actually appears in one of them. A number of really important myths seem to have their first or at least their oldest surviving articulation with Inanna. The story of Venus and Adonis, for example, or the abduction of Persephone by Hades. These are both late reflexes of Inanna's descent to the underworld, which is a wonderful story. She also has, it seems, a connection with Athena, who, though, of course, probably the least erotic of the Olympian gods, is not just a female war deity, but more powerful than Ares, the other war deity. But enough about her for now. I think probably during a conversation on Wednesday, we'll have a fair bit to say about Ishtar. Well, I think I might add one more thing, and that is that the city of Uruk was Ishtar's city. Each of the gods was associated with a particular city. Uruk was Ishtar's. So the temple in Uruk, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, is a temple to Ishtar. And it's reasonably speculated that as priest king of Uruk, Gilgamesh would be expected to enter into a sacred marriage with the goddess or the goddess's representative on earth, namely a priestess. But as I said, I don't want to give too much of that away right now. Just want to lay that out as background. But this information might help you interpret the encounter between Shamhat, the temple prostitute, and Enkidu. And it will also give us a context in which to view Gilgamesh's relationship with Ishtar as it plays out in the epic. Anyways, onward. As for the other gods, I'll just say a little bit about a few of them now, and the rest we'll just pick up as we go through the text. The next most important one in the tale is Shamash, whose Sumerian name was Utu. Shamash is basically Apollo. He's the god of the sun of oracles, of justice, truth, healing, and he seems to take a particular interest in Gilgamesh. As for Enlil, he is the chief of the gods, kind of a counterpart to Zeus. He is an air god, credited with separating the heavens from the earth at the creation. He's generally not too pleased with human beings, doesn't like us all that much, but I'm not going to say much more about that now. We'll see exactly how he doesn't like us in the second half of the poem. Often pitted against Enlil is the god Enki, also called Ea. He's associated with wisdom, magic, and fresh water. And unlike Enlil, he is generally sympathetic to humans. And again, I'm not going to say too much about him here because we will meet him in the second half of the epic, so we'll be talking about him a fair bit next week. 
The last item I should probably get into for this little introduction is the history of the tale itself. It goes back quite a ways. Though the version we're looking at is not written in Sumerian, the tale certainly dates back to the Sumerian period, specifically the late 3rd millennium BC. Gilgamesh seems to have been priest-king of Uruk round about 2600 BC. That is, he was probably a historical figure. His name appears on king lists from the period, as does the name of his father, Lugalbanda. He is credited with having built the walls around the city and having rebuilt a shrine in Nippur. This probably would have been a shrine to Enlil, as Nippur was the city sacred to Enlil. And as I mentioned, I think earlier on in the intro, the spiritual center of the Sumerian world. By the 25th century BC, Gilgamesh had come to be regarded as a god. He was often associated with the god Enki, actually, and there are a number of poems associated with him in Sumerian. The versions that we have date probably to the 19th or 18th centuries BC, but were probably composed in the late 3rd millennium. The first really long Gilgamesh narrative, the first fully-fledged epic of Gilgamesh, is probably the old Babylonian version, which dates to about 1700 BC. As I said before, Babylonian is a Semitic language, but the Semitic peoples of the area had largely taken on the mythology of the Sumerians and cultivated Sumerian as their language of learning. This being the case, it was very easy for the Gilgamesh narratives and the Inanna Ishtar narratives to cross that cultural border from the Sumerians to the various Semitic peoples. The writer or writers of the Old Babylonian version certainly drew on the Sumerian tales, and as I said, unified them into a single narrative. In the older versions, in the older narratives, Enkidu is Gilgamesh's servant. It's in the Old Babylonian version that Enkidu becomes his friend. And the focus in the Old Babylonian version shifts from Gilgamesh's various exploits, which are always interesting and fun to read about, and which are often mythologically oriented, to his relationship with Enkidu as a friend, to the study, really, of, of friendship. Gilgamesh and Enkidu's relationship is the oldest surviving exploration we have of friendship and also of the emotion of grief. It's in the Old Babylonian version where the focus also shifts to Gilgamesh's attempt to overcome mortality. The story of Gilgamesh seems to have been popular throughout the ancient Near Eastern world. There are versions of it occurring in Akkadian, Hurrian, Hittite, dating from between 1600 and 1000 BC. The version we're reading, called the Standard Version, dates to about 1250 BC. This also is written in Babylonian and was preserved on clay tablets. The scribe responsible for this version made a number of additions to the poem, which I'll discuss in a minute. Overall, though, I bring up the widespread distribution of Gilgamesh, of Gilgamesh narratives, to indicate the broadly human appeal of this story. By the time the Homeric epics were composed and finally written down sometime around 750 BC, stories of Gilgamesh were almost 2,000 years old already. And there is, by the way, demonstrable influence of Gilgamesh in both Homeric epics. There is also demonstrable influence of Gilgamesh and its associated narratives in the, uh, in the Old Testament. In fact, the rediscovery of the literature of that part of the world during archaeological excavations in the late 19th and early 20th centuries completely transformed Old Testament scholarship by providing many analogs to narratives whose previously oldest attestation had been the book of Genesis, which is very late. That, however, is a theme I'm going to pursue in the talk I post next week. As for the additions that the scribe made to the standard version, there are three. One, a 26-line prologue, which establishes much of the theme of the poem. Two, 
an account of a global flood, which we'll see in the second half of the poem, and which has an interesting relationship with the flood myth in Genesis. And three, material omitted in the edition we're looking at for various textual reasons that pertains to Gilgamesh and Enkidu in the netherworld. You can find this in the appendix to the Norton Critical Edition. So if you want to read that, by all means do. The reason, one of the reasons I like the Norton Critical Edition is all of the other material that you actually have in the, in the back in the appendices. This is not just one Gilgamesh narrative. It's almost like a Gilgamesh anthology. For now, though, I think that's all I really need to get into to get you set up to appreciate or understand what it is we're actually reading. I'll have some questions up for you shortly on our Moodle page, and I look forward very much to seeing what you think and seeing how you are interpreting and appreciating this wonderful story. And, of course, I really look forward to talking to you about it on Wednesday. Bye for now.